Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. I'm delighted to see you all here today. Uh, and equally delighted to have those of you that are joining us online to be worshiping with us that way this morning. I'd like to say a special word of welcome to visitors in both places. We're particularly grateful for your presence with us and hope that you find this time of worship together uh, to be meaningful. It is a busy time in the life of the church, so please do take a few moments to look at the announcements that are before you in the bulletin this week. Uh, but before we do, I'm going to ask Amanda Ogden to step up. She has a few things to say about some of those. Good morning. I have a couple of items from PW. First of all, we want to invite everyone um, after worship into Watchhorn Hall for our second annual cookie contest. Um, thank you to everyone who brought cookies for the contest. And there will be hot cocoa and gingerbread houses for the kids to make. And we also have our fundraiser going on. You can buy one of these jars for $10. It has everything almost that you need to make a batch of cookies. You just dump this into a bowl with two eggs and a half a cup of oil, and you have cookie dough. And um, we'd love if you could support PW. This supports all of our missions and our activities throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess we had a slight miscommunication. I was expecting Mr. Tack this morning, but uh, you'll know one of our denominational offerings uh, is the Christmas Joy Offering. Uh, that offering will be collected next week, and so I don't know, maybe there's an insert in your bulletin uh, this week about that, but there definitely will be. Yep, so there's, please see the insert in your bulletin this week, uh, and we'll have another word about that uh, during our worship next week. Uh, it, let's see, and... Thank you all who brought purple bags. We look forward to dedicating those later. If you're visiting with us, that's a monthly food offering that goes to Urban Mission from this place. Um, so now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. You'll please stand if you're comfortable doing so. We light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ. Advent means coming. We are preparing ourselves for the days when the nation shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The, lo the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together. And the little child shall lead them. Worship <laughs> God.
please join me in the prayer of the day. Eternal God, you taught us that the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Keep us awake and alert, watching for your kingdom, and make us strong in faith, so that when Christ comes in glory to judge the earth, we may joyfully give him praise, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. God of fierce compassion, you call us to make our way straight, yet we get lost down crooked roads of selfish concern. We are to prepare the way for your reign of justice, but we choose easier paths of comfort. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and set us back to work. Clearing paths of justice, building highways of peace, and preparing the world for your return. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy, who forgives you all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To this peace, we are called as members of a single body. The peace of Christ be with you.
Is it by Ellie? That's fun. All right, so we've been studying the Lord's Prayer to find out about the parts of prayer. And so far we've found out that prayer has praise, and so does the Lord's Prayer. Asking for God's will is part of prayer, and asking for help. And today we're going to learn that saying I'm sorry is part of prayer. Um, there's a line in the Lord's Prayer that says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. A debt is when you owe someone something. And in this prayer, it means you've done something wrong and you need to give God an apology. You need to say, I'm sorry that you did something. At the same time, if someone does something wrong to you and they say they're sorry, you also you have to kind of forgive them for that. Okay, so that's what that part of the prayer moves means. So I have to tell you a story. When I was in second grade, this was a very long time ago. Uh, very. I don't really remember much about second grade, but I do remember this. Guess what happened? My teacher gave me a note to go and bring to another teacher. And she said, don't read it. So I went in the hallway, and I read it. <laughs> and I can't remember what it said. It must have been really big, <laughs> but I don't remember. But what I do remember is she caught me. She caught me reading the note after she said, don't read the note. So she then said to me, you do not deserve to be in second grade. I am going to put you back into kindergarten. They don't do that now. They don't do this anymore. But they put me in kindergarten. And what was really bad and embarrassing about that, my sister was in kindergarten. <laughs> and I thought, oh, she's going to tell my parents. And I'm going to be in trouble at home. And I was so worried about that. I worried for weeks and weeks and weeks. It was like I had this big, oh, like rock in my heart. I just, oh, it was terrible. And it took a long time for me to just get over that. So my parents never knew. But I realized that what I should have done was pray to God and said I was sorry for reading the note and then ask him for help in telling my parents. And I know that both God and my parents would have forgiven me. That's what I should have done. I should have gone through all that worry. And the, and the reason is that forgiveness is a powerful act of love and kindness. And it can help us to feel happier and more at peace with ourselves and with others when we forgive and when we feel like we're being forgiven. So remember to just pray and say you're sorry. And maybe say you're sorry to others instead of waiting. All right, let's just go right to the Lord's Prayer because today, because this is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, his friends. And we, it's a very important prayer. We still say it today, right? We say it every week in church. So here we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, we're going to go back upstairs, and we're going to practice again. As the children make their way out, I would like to ask those that are to be ordained and installed this morning if they would come meet me in front of the steps. Friends, today we ordain and install 
Suzanne Baxter as an elder to the class of 2027, and install Rachel Boggess, uh, Jim Bowman, David Ligon, and Larry Nichols as elders to the class of 2027. We also install Blaine Moore, Danny Alvera, and Debbie Pittman as deacons of the class of 2027. In every age, God has called forth leaders to serve and equip them with God's gifts to do so. Among the people of Israel, God anointed prophets, priests, and rulers. God called pastors and teachers, bishops and elders, and deacons to build up God's church. With Moses, the 70 elders bore the burdens of God's people, ministered in the power of the Spirit. Alongside the apostles, deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's grace. In the church, deacons, elders, and pastors serve together so that your God's whole people might be equipped for ministry and built up into the full unity in Christ. For your servants in every age, O God, and for the church of Jesus Christ, we give you our thanks and praise. In baptism, Suzanne Baxter, Rachel Bogus, Jim Bowman, David Ligon, Larry Nichols, Blaine Moore, Danny Olvera, and Debbie Pittman were clothed with Christ and are now called by God through the voice of the church to enter into ministries of service and governance, announcing in word and deed the good news of Jesus Christ. Friends, do you trust in Jesus Christ your Savior? Acknowledge Him as Lord of all and head of the church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to us? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you? I do. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, Subject to the ordering of God's Word and Spirit, will you? Will. will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world, will you? Will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church, do you? Do. And will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, will you? Will. To the deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ, will you? I will. And to the elders, will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service. Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? I will. Barbara, if you would ask the next questions. Uh, please join me early. Uh, coming up next is the uh, prayer for the deacons. No, I'm, I'm sorry. There are questions uh, I failed to mark that you need to ask the congregation. I apologize. I misdid her script. I don't think I have that on here. To the deacons. 
Here we go. Do we, the members of the church, accept the elders and the deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of this church? God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit on Blaine, Danny, and Debbie, that they may be felt faithful deacons in the church. Give them openness to the Holy Spirit's leading so that they may see and serve wherever there is need. Train them in the school of prayer that they may express the compassion of Christ for the poor and the friendless, the sick, the grieving, and the troubled. In everything, give them the mind of Christ who did not grasp at greatness, but emptied himself to become a servant of your reign. Give them joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work of ministry. For the elders, God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit on Suzanne, Rachel, Jim, David, and Larry, that they may be faithful elders in the church Give them prudence and sound judgment, wisdom, and courage to order the life of the church in obedience to your word. Nourish them in the life of the Holy Spirit that they may exercise the ministry of discipline with humility and compassion. Give them in governance on this session and in every court of the church that they may be servant leaders following Christ who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Give them joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work of ministry. Gracious God, pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church, that we may be for you a holy people, baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain this congregation and ministry. Ground us in the gospel. Secure our hope in Christ. Strengthen our service to the outcast and increase our love for one another. We pray that you show us the transforming power of your grace and our life together, that we may be servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'd now like to invite officers in this church, uh, elders, deacons, uh, ministers of word and sacrament, and this or any other PCUSA denomination to please come down for the laying on of hands. Suzanne Baxter, Rachel Bogus, Jim Bowman, David Ligon, Larry Nichols, Lane Moore, Danny Alvera, Debbie Pittman. You are now deacons and elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for these members and the gifts that you have blessed them with and their willingness to use them uh, to the church's greater glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please take a moment to welcome the newly ordained and installed.
Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 24 through 45. If you'd like to follow along, it's on page 56 of your pew Bible. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me in this time, when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angels, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning we'll continue our series during this Advent of uh, preachings based on scriptures and lessons in our Advent devotional for this year. Uh, large print available, uh, large print copies are available this week. I apologize that the copier failed us last week and others um, are available in the narthex of the smaller size if you didn't have a chance to pick one up last Sunday. In this week's lesson, when we are weary, Reverend Cecilia Armstrong writes in our Advent devotional that we find it hard to express joy because our weariness has seemingly stolen our joy. She then asks an intriguing question, is it even possible to be joy-filled by yourself? Clearly there are things that we can do that will bring us joy bake the perfect pumpkin empanada, hit a drive that actually lands in the fairway. But what external joy is possible without others to acknowledge it? What good is a hole in one if you're the only one that sees it? Reverend Armstrong invites us to wonder this week, wonder, could it be that internal joy 
can only be actualized in external connections. How are we connected and how is that important? What is without question is that shared joy is one of the ways that a weary world can rejoice. Mary sets out with haste to enter the house of Zechariah and greet Elizabeth. She went on a mission to get clarity about her own encounter with Gabriel. We don't hear the questions that are resonating inside her. We hear her question, Gabriel, wondering how this can be since she is a virgin, but we don't hear her inner dialogue during her travels. Two pregnant women meeting and sharing their experience with one another. Two pregnant women who are related, but very different from one another. One is young and one is old. One is married and one is not married yet. One is carrying the word of God. (laughs) And one is carrying the one who prepares the way. Those blessings are also burdens. It is when they are connected that they experience shared joy. It is when they are connected that they can share the blessing and the burden of the divine interruption in their lives. It is when they are connected that they can comfort each other. Sometimes even joy presents a need for comfort. If you are a father, how did you find out? Do you remember how you felt in that moment? My joy was exploding inside me. I wanted to tell the world. I wanted to shout it from the rooftops. But unfortunately, we know how pregnancies sometimes go. And so we hesitate to share the joy with others until we feel it is safe to do so. And then we share what is perhaps the greatest joy we have ever felt with the world. We find joy in the joy and excitement that others have for us. Baby showers are planned. We planned one when Aiden was born, but it wasn't scheduled in time. You see, at 26 weeks, our daughter, would be born to save her mother's life. I felt, I think, the theological term is weird. (laughs) More joy than I had ever experienced in this life. Yet my daughter was too fragile to live without the godsend of modern medicine. Thanks be to two neonatal intensive care units and a helicopter ride, We took her home two months later, and she's turned out just fine. The day before she was born, I experienced a connectedness with God that I've never felt before and rarely talked about. At that point, my wife and my daughter's lives were at risk. When Darcy had been transported to the hospital, several hours away from where we lived, had settled in and dozed off, I walked into the waiting room to call my parents and tell them where we were. Before I could though, I was stopped in my tracks. As I went through the door, at the sight of three pastors who were my dad's friends and lived in the city where we had ended up, They had each known me from my birth, and I knew and respected them like they were second fathers to me. I spiritually collapsed in their arms. I was mentally and emotionally overwhelmed and spiritually numb. When I entered that waiting room, I didn't even know how much I needed them to hold me in prayer and remind me that my family was not alone. Remind me that whatever happened, 
They were there for me. I had never had a situation in my life where I felt so carried by others. As we gathered in a four-way hug, I felt the Holy Spirit's presence lift me from a troubled place to a place of peace. That experience changed my faith forever. I've never thought about the power of two or three gathered in Christ's name in the same way after that moment. Christian connection is real. Connecting with another person on a faith level on what you believe about God and the world and your place in it, that's as real as life gets. Presbyterians are a connectional church. We're connected in the way that we do our government. We're connected in the way that we do our mission. And as a congregation, we need to be connected to each other. That's why things like our first Sunday lunches are so important. Things like our mission opportunities to volunteer together are so important. Serving on councils and committees that are not exclusive to elders and deacons are important because it is in those places that we get to know each other on a much deeper level so that we can connect more than just in the passing of the peace. So that when we hit a bump in the road, we can be there for one another. Because as long as sin is present in this world, the world will be weary. There are times in our lives where we will all need comfort. Mary and Elizabeth had shown us the comfort in connecting and the resulting joy that can come through those shared blessings and shared burdens. Thanks be to God that we are not in this alone. Amen. Each week, there's an artistic expression uh, and also a hymn and a poem uh, that are written to accompany the scripture passage. Uh, If you don't know what to do, 
uh, to help a weary world uh, and want to be connected with people, I would like to ask you uh, to sing the hymn that is offered uh, in this week's devotional every day this week before you start your personal time of devotion and let that frame your thoughts uh, for your time with God um, this week. And so to introduce that for our prayer of the day uh, today, prayers of the people, I've asked Puffer and John if they would uh, introduce that hymn to us that you'll found, you will find printed uh, in the devotional for this second week. I can celebrate The church has different ways to receive your pledges, tithes, and offering. If you're worshiping with us in the sanctuary today, offering plates are located by the doors as you exit the sanctuary. Please drop your offering in the plate. If you are worshiping with us from home today, you can support us through the website by clicking the Give button on the home page. Through Venmo, by searching for FBC OKC, or you can mail your contrib contribution to the church. Thank you for your support of the ministry of First Presbyterian. Now let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. The earth is the Lord's and that all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Let us worship God with our pledges, tithes, and offerings.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. We ask your blessing also on our purple bag food offering. Bless those who filled them and those who will receive them. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I charge you to go out from this place and continue living in the midst of God's purpose for your life. And as you do, may God bless you and keep you. May God let the wisdom of God's faith shine upon you and grant you peace this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>